Today's talk is going to be about the Marxian theory of rent and the economic position of the aristocracy. I'm opening it up with a picture of the castle of the Duke of Athol in the countryside that he controls and owns. This guy is so anachronistic and wealthy that he still maintains a private army, the Athol, the Athol Highlanders Regiment. Now, what is the mechanism by which the aristocracy maintain their wealth and derive their income? I'm going to be talking about the general importance of the landlord class, why it's still important, how rent works. Uh, I may talk about in future um, videos about land price and urban ground rent. And I'll also talk about historic class struggle over rent uh, in, in British politics. Now, I gave you those images at the beginning of the Duke's castle. The concentration of land holding has scarcely altered in Britain since the 19th century. The same aristocratic families own a large part of the country. Insofar as there's any been any change, financial aristocracy and monarchs from other parts of the world like Arabia have bought into uh, existing feudal estates. And research has shown that the aristocracy's position has been improving in recent decades. They've more than doubled their share of national wealth in the last um, decade during the recession when most people were getting worse off they have doubled their wealth and as a position or share of the upper classes their position has strengthened now in order to understand the revenue that the upper class have you need to understand the theory of differential rent which was originally developed by Ricardo and the basic thesis of it is that the price of agricultural products, whether you're talking about corn or cattle, is determined by the labour needed to produce them. But there is a, a contradiction here. In industry, there's no problem with that. There is a fairly strong pressure, for instance, uh, in car factories, for all car factories to adopt the most modern and efficient methods of production, so that the labour to produce car won't vary wide, widely. On the other hand, with agriculture, there is a big variation. On good land, less labour is needed to raise crops or animals than on poor land. And at any one time, the marginal fields, uh, marginal in two senses, one in the sense of the ones that are, are at the edge of cultivation, and the other in a sort of conceptual sense and the ones which just pay, the marginal fields will be those where the labour required to raise the crop just equals the market value of cattle or corn or whatever the crop is when you express that market value in terms of the monetary equivalent of labour time. Now the difference between marginal land and good land is obvious. Here's marginal upland land being used to raise highland cattle. Here's lowland pasture land, which, as you can just glance at it, raises far more cattle per acre because it has better quality grass and it's also easier for those raising the cattle because the cattle are concentrated, they don't have to traverse rough country to get to the animals, etc. Now, Ricardo's thesis is that the price of any agricultural product is set by the marginal fields which are being brought into play. And as population rose, Farming had to move from the fertile valleys to the marginal fields on the slopes. 
and as this happened, the labour input to raise corn or cattle increased, and thus the price of crops rose. And this was really happening at the time he wrote. He was writing during the Napoleonic Wars, uh, when food shortages meant that poor hill land was being brought into use to a much greater extent than had ever occurred before, and in consequence, the price of food was rising. Now, what was the consequence of this economically? Um, hill pastures were being converted to grow crops. These had poor yields per person year, poor yields per acre, and the landlords, as Smith said, like all other men, loved to reap where they never sowed and demand a rent even for the natural produce of the earth. The effect of this rise in the cost of producing grain, rise in the cost of producing cattle, meant that the landlords were able to demand more rent. But why were they able to do that? It's because the landlord class is able to claim the whole difference in productivity between good and poor soils. And the tenants have to pay the difference or get evicted when their lease runs out. The leases might be 20 year lease, fixed rent the farmer has to pay for 20 years. The end of the period, if the price of crops has risen, the, the landlord will demand a higher price for renting the land and the tenant either gets evicted or pays the price. Let's take an example here. I'm taking a lowland farm in England or an upland farm in Scotland or in the um, maybe in the Pennines. Uh, the actual number of cows per hectare on lowland farms in England would be about two. An upland farm in Scotland, you'd be lucky if you got half a cow per hectare. Now, I'm actually making up the number of uh, person days work because the person days work varies with the size of the the land, ho the, the, the tenancy, it varies with the use of modern machinery, etc. But let's take these figures uh, as as rough figures for now. So if you go to 50 hectare farm in both places, the, the farm on the lowland area will raise 100 cows. The farm in the upland area, 25 cows. But the amount of labor doesn't fall in proportion to the amount of cows because the upland farm is harder to work. So there's a, some fall of labor, but not such a big fall of labor. So the amount of labor required per cow might be only six days of labour on the lowland farm, 16 days of labour on the upland farm. But because the marginal farm set the value for cows, the market value of cows is going to be 16. And the output of the lowland farm will sell for 1,600 or the equivalent 1,600, the amount of money equivalent to 1,600 days of labour. The upland farm will sell for 400 days of labour. Now, I should have made that rent 1,200 there. I made it too low. But the, the difference between the rent of the two farms, sorry, no, the rent is, wrong, is right. If we look at the upland farm, there's 600 person days of labor going to the work. The difference in productivity, or the difference in productivity is equivalent to a thousand days because it sells for 1600. Now that entire margin of sale ends up being appropriated by the landlords. The, by the time the next lease comes up, the lowland farmer is no better off than the upland farmer. All his extra profitability ends up being appropriated by the landlord 
once the lease runs out. Now, the next striking thing about this is that the rent that the landlords can appropriate can actually be greater than the total labour performed on the lowland farm. So they are appropriating a surplus labour of 1,000 days, even though the total number of days worked was only 600. Now this is unlike the position of the capitalist class who could only appropriate a portion of the labour that is actually performed. So where does this come from? Where does this extra surplus come from that the landlord class appropriates? The landlords can extract more rent than the total labour because food costs are set by the marginal labour content, not the average labour content. And this surplus becomes a deduction from the revenue of the urban capitalist class. What happens is that high food costs may lead to higher wages and lower profits for capital. And this was the fundamental cause of the conflict between landowners and capital, which dominated the politics of the 19th century and which was expressed in the two main political parties of the 19th century, which were the Tories, which represented the landlords, and the Liberals, which represented the manufacturing uh, urban capitalists. In the early part of the century, the landlords were unequivocally dominant and were able to set the agenda in terms of trade policy. They had what are called the Corn Laws. Those of you who are from Britain will have heard of these in your, your school history probably, but for people who are outside Britain, the Corn Laws were a set of Tory laws that prohibited the import of grain and aimed to keep food prices high. The purpose of this was to keep the rents of the landlords high, but from the point of view of the urban population, it meant hunger and starvation. It meant food prices were prohibitively high, living con real wages were falling, and uh, malnutrition was rife. But on the other hand, the aristocracy were doing very well. The countryside is still littered with stately homes that they built and the revenues they got during the Georgian and Regency years. It eventually came to an end in 1846 when the famines contributed to by this Corn Law policy killed a million people in, in Ireland and caused widespread famines across Scotland as well. And this forced the Tory party itself to split and repeal the, the Corn Laws and allow the free import of food. In consequence, Canada was allowed to become the marginal cornland for Britain. Now, Ricardo's theory is based on the marginal land always being less productive. So when Marx was writing his analysis of differential rent in the 1860s, he was pointing out that, in fact, the opposite situation can occur that the North American plains were now the marginal lands, and these were more productive in terms of the labour required to produce food than the domestic lands. The introduction of steam transport meant that crops grown on the, on the prairies could be shipped to the metropolis, and if you look at the change in the use of land, historical changes in the use of land, you find that if you look at tithe maps from the early 19th century, much more of the country was given over to urban, to, to arable land growing corn, and much less was given over to pasture land as it now is, because the high cost of corn justified the high cost of corn artificially imposed by food tariffs justified raising corn on marginal upland slopes. With the repeal of the corn laws and the introduction of steam 
transport and the opening up of the prairies, agricultural prices started to decline and went in agriculture in Britain went into a recession from the 1870s and stayed low until the Second World War. The aristocracy lost substantial rent incomes. They declined in the share of wealth held by the ruling class. They declined as the share of the millionaires that were aristocrats relative to industrialists fell. And as the dominant section of the uh, upper class, they were replaced by the manufacturing bourgeoisie. However, in the last um, 40, 50 years, we've seen a resurgence of the wealth and influence of the aristocracy. And what does that rest on? Well, basically, it rests on a reversal of the old policy of cheap food imports. The common agricultural policy, which was introduced prior to Britain joining the common market as a means of securing a class alliance between the bourgeoisie in France and the petty bourgeois farmers, when extended to Britain, where there were still feudal estates and feudal land ownership had not been abolished, the effect was to shift rents up. As leases expired and were renegotiated, the aristocracy were able to raise their rents and increase their rent revenues. They were also in direct receipt of, of public subsidies from the common agricultural policy. And this means that their current position is that they're now as wealthy as in the peak of the 19th century. If you measure it by the value of their probate estates, that is to say, the value of the estates that members of the aristocracy leave to their heirs, if you value that in um, real terms, not uh, not just in, in current pounds, but what the, in terms of purchasing power, it has reached the peak, their wealth has re resumed the, the peak level it had in the middle of the 19th century, before the agricultural recession. Now, in the context of the Brexit crisis, the EU and the CAP are producing a split in the upper classes analogous to that of the 1840s. The capitalists themselves are split into, into different factions, pro and anti-Brexit, and the interests of the aristocracy are affected. One of the things which there's a lot of news items about is tariffs against UK livestock exports to the EU. What will the effect of these be? They will depress the domestic price of livestock and reduce the rent that the aristocracy can obtain from grazing land. And a return to the 1846 to 1973 policy of tariff-free imports will reduce domestic uh, food prices for crops and reduce the rent obtainable on arable land as well. Now, from a socialist point of view, lower food prices and lower rents to the aristocracy are great. But so long as commodity production exists, rent has to exist. It's either appropriated by the direct holder of the soil if all the farms were handed to the tenant farmers. A tenant farmer would now be an owner farmer on a fertile piece of land will be getting more value for his labour than a farmer on an upland tract of land. So they would be appropriating the rent income. Their labour would realise more than an hour's labour for every labour that hour of labour they put in. But from our point of view, it would be much better if the large private estates reverted to the state and rents were paid to the exchequer. We can't do away with the rents, but they should be appropriated to the exchequer, which was the basic demand in the Communist Manifesto of 1848, that the land should be nationalised and the rent of land used for public purposes.